And now, from God's Unchanging Word Studios in New Orleans, we are pleased to bring you news, nuggets, and insights with today's host, Tom Carey. Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to God's Unchanging Word in another edition for our news, nuggets, and insights. And today is Friday, May 20, 2022. We are just passing the midway point in our march to the promised land. We've got a lot to talk about today. I'm going to get right into it. News briefs in America and around the world. There's so much going on. We're just going to pull in a couple of clips to begin the program with. And then we're going to focus on this, the crisis in America that continues to deteriorate. We did a sermon last year, and I'm going to show you what that's about because I'm going to update it this coming Sabbath. And I'll talk to you about that in the program. And here's some more lessons from the lean. This time we're going to take a lesson in the middle of the desert. This is the instruction God gave to the Israelites as Moses began to recount their journey from the time God called them in Egypt to bring them to the promised land. There's a big lesson here for you and I. All righty, let's get into it. The world watch. Peace, peace, when there is no peace. All around the world, the, the peace that was seemingly there is rapidly disappearing. Now we have Finland and Sweden petitioning the NATO to be able to enter, and they're looking at their protection. Of course, the bully over there, Russia, doesn't like this, and Russia now warns of a nuclear weapons in the Baltic region if Sweden and Finland join NATO. This has been a concern of Russia for a long time, and in fact, that was one of the reasons why they began to invade the Ukraine. So what are we looking at? Are we looking at a deliberate attempt to escalate this war into the NATO nation so we can bring America into it? I don't know, but it sure appears to be going in that direction week by week as we look into this. Moscow has said that it will be forced to strengthen its defenses in the Baltic, Finland, and Sweden if they join NATO, including deploying nuclear weapons. They're not opposed to deploying nuclear weapons. By the way, China said that, and so has North Korea. So who knows where this is all going to end. But it's something we're definitely going to keep on our radar. All right, crisis and nation in denial. Last year, in, in August, we, I brought out a sermon called, you know, A Nation in Crisis, basically talking about America. Well, what I want to do this weekend is I'm going to bring an update. I may just call it Crisis in America 2022. I don't know. But the reason I'm bringing it up is that a lot of the information that God's been sharing with his church and we've been able to bring to you, especially over the last seven years, they're prophetic in nature. And it's, it's incumbent upon us from time to time to step back and take a look at that information that God gave to us and see where we are in time See if it's true or not true. Is it coming to pass? All these things we need to continually to look at. So what I'm going to do today is give you a taste of what we're going to do on this sermon this Saturday to show you how fast prophecy is moving as it becomes current events. This was last year we brought this out. Talking about crime, how it was out of control. Talking about cities braced for the deadly summer. This is all 2020 and 2021 that we're looking at here. And as you look at that, you'll see that now in 2022, we are escalating beyond what we looked at in the previous two years. So let's take a look at this. Just this past weekend, you probably heard about the mass shootings of the gentleman up in New York. And because it's drawn the attention... It was racial, and of course it was. And we've been warning that the continual racial issues eventually could erupt into a war again in the United States. And now the media seems to be pushing in that direction. But here's what you didn't hear. Same weekend, 109 people were killed in the United States in other mass shootings said it's week 19, or 19 weeks into the new year, and we've already seen 198 mass shootings. But here's the problem. This doesn't fit the narrative. It doesn't make headlines. It's normal now that we have mass shootings all over the place. And out of that, 109 people were killed. How come we're not talking about that? Because it doesn't fit the narrative. 
This is the one you hear about. Ten people killed and an additional three injured make this weekend racially motivated attack in Buffalo supermarket the deadliest mass shooting of the year in the United States. And that's all true. It's absolutely true. But until we get the CRT and until we get the news to begin to realize what is going on here, you're not going to resolve that issue. You're only going to make it worse. And it is going to get worse, and you're going to continue to see it growing. How about this? A curfew imposed after three killed, 24 wounded in Milwaukee. How about that? Did that hit the headlines? It's not even out there. How about the church mass shooting in California? Well, that finally hit the news after a day or so. But went on in Milwaukee, erupted in gunfire Friday. Nine separate shootings that left three people dead and 24 wounded in a city of less than 600 people. Now, this isn't some war region in, in the Middle East. This is in America. What's going on today is as you continue to move God out of the picture and God takes his protection away, Satan's anger just erupts into the world and we're seeing it all across our nation. Now, what about this? Protesters rally across the nation for abortion rights after the Supreme Court's draft opinion was leaked. Now, we knew this was coming. Now they're promising, in the news, just came out on Monday and Tuesday, is they're talking about a summer of violence and protest because of the abortion issue. Let's play this first video. video. If abortions aren't safe, then you aren't either. That's just part of the message outside Wisconsin Family Action here, and it continues inside the building. What you're seeing around me right now, this isn't the answer to anything. Also written in debris and glass in her office, Wisconsin Family Action President Julian Appling says the message is clear. It's precipitated by the leaked Supreme Court opinion, right? I mean, it's obvious. Madison police say it appears someone threw a Molotov cocktail inside the building. So how did the media cover this? Well, here's Politico, which is not even a news organization anymore. Here's how they describe this firebombing. Quote, a fire broke out Sunday at the office of an anti-abortion group in Madison, Wisconsin. Oh, a fire broke out. Really? The Hill newspaper agreed. Quote, fire breaks out at Wisconsin anti-abortion group office. Oh, just broke out. According to the police chief in Madison, where it happened, quote, the arson is not considered a terrorist incident. So... Firebombing with Molotov cocktails, for political reasons, threats left on the wall and spray paint, definitely not terrorism. Let's call it activism, because, you know, a fire broke out. This was the scene of the Sunday Mass in Los Angeles. Respect us. Respect us. You want to respect, 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 there's also, by the way, a federal law that makes intimidating churchgoers illegal. It's 18 U.S.C. 247, for the record. But the Biden administration has no interest in, particular, in protecting this particular reviled minority. They're ignoring the whole thing. That means that churches now need armed guards to protect themselves, but those guards are also now being targeted. Watch. Hey, you to take care of people! We pay you to take care of people! And this was a scene outside the Basilica of St. Patrick's Old Cathedral in New York City on Saturday. Watch. I'm killing the baby. 
I, I don't I don't know. I mean, I never I never imagined a nation could reach the point to have such anger and such vitriol and vulgarity when they don't have a right to kill their own babies. You have to wonder when God says, listen, enough is enough. There's no saving this society. But what you're looking at is just the tip of the iceberg for what's coming. And we have been saying for, since this program, at least for the last four and a half to five years, it's eventually going to lead into where the conservative Christian movement, that's what we're talking about, and you heard it there, is that they are the minority now who are going to be attacked. And that's what's going on right now. They're at the doorsteps of many churches. They're in the churches and they're firebombing anybody who protects pro-rights of human life. I don't know what to say when I see this. There's more I watched I couldn't even bring you. People cheering on to suck the little out and dismember it and everybody cheering. These are human lives. Unbelievable what we're witnessing. Let's go on. I got to I got to move away from that subject. It's just it's just I don't know, it's just, it just so bad to see that much hatred of people who want to protect life to, do, to go in that direction. All right, this was the sermon from August of 2021. Now, I'm bringing this out because I want to show how fast the nation's deteriorating. All right, this was, this was the sermon, A Nation in Crisis. And so I think I'll just keep the same sermon. What do y'all think? Just put 2022. And maybe what we ought to do maybe once a year just go back and show us how fast things are moving. Because you see, God says, I'm not going to do anything till I tell my people first. And so what we do here when we look at this is we go back to say, what did God tell us? And then we need to see if we can resolve it in our mind. Are we remembering what he told us? And he tells us that because he knows where he's taking us so that we can be protected when we go. And if you don't follow God's lead, you're not going to know where to go. We learned that example with Joshua when he crossed the Jordan, he went into the promised land. And God says, listen, follow my lead because you've never been this way before. We're moving in uncharted territories. Now, I don't care how many people in churches across the country will tell you, we've always had this. No, we've never had what the United States is doing right now and what it's moving into. We've never had it. All right, let's move on. There are many unknowns, right? We don't, there's a lot of things we don't know, but in America, there is a crisis. That much, at least half the country at this point, can begin to understand there is at least a crisis in America. In fact, in some areas, there's as many as 80 to 88 percent. You know why? Because now it's hitting the budgets of people's of, of people's wallets. It's hitting their homes and people being put in the street because until it affects you, most of the time, people have no need or want to listen to it. See, God has numbered your kingdom, he says, and has finished it. You are weighed in the balance and you are left warning. That's from Daniel. So we're in the seventh year of a seven year cycle. And in this year, you can expect things to continue to deteriorate as we move closer and closer to the, the fall holy days in this seventh year, and who knows what the next seven-year cycle will bring. So here's a question. How do you convince a nation that is in denial, that is rapidly collapsing and nearing the end of its days? Even though the stock market has tanked almost 20 and 30 percent in many, many parts of the economy, the prices for people are paying for things, and I'll show you today, continue to go up. Many people believe it's just a phase, and we're going to get through this, and it's going to come back, and we're all going to be fine. Well, we'll see. The prophet Ezekiel was given the question that I just gave to you with his task, and the task has commissioned that now to his church, the end time work to warn and prepare the people for the return of Jesus Christ. In the book of Ezekiel, chapter 2, God says, He said to me, Son of man, stand upon your feet, and I will speak to you. And the Spirit entered me, and when he had spoke to me, he set me upon my feet. And he said, Son of man, I send you to the children of Israel, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They had and their fathers have transgressed me even unto this day. Now, when you read that scripture, I want you to think about the video you just saw.
in that woman in front of that church pretending she just pulled the baby out of her body and she's ripping it apart. I killed my baby. I killed my baby. Unbelievable what she's saying. And it became even more vulgar when I had to cut it off. I couldn't even show that in this program, in her, her, her example of what was going on. She says, for they are imp impudent children and stiff-hearted. He says, I do send you to them, and you shall say to them, thus says the Lord God, and whether they hear you or whether they will forbear, for they are a rebellious house, yet you shall know that there has been a prophet among them. And a prophet in the terms that God talks about from the New Testament is they a person who has been inspired by God and commissioned to go warn this world. They will know that that person was among them. That is the work of the church. Matthew 24 says, Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When its branch is yet tender and he puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. And I'll say to you that this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. In that chapter, it's called the Olivet Prophecy, what Jesus Christ was given to his apostles and left for you and I, is the process of how things begin to build. And in that process, there's a, there's a scripture that says, unless he cuts time short, no flesh would be saved. Now, we are living in that time when it's possible to destroy human flesh many times over. And we're looking at the nations and the leaders of nations now from at least three countries saying that we're going to use nuclear weapons if we have to. Some of them are saying we will use them as a preemptive strike to protect our nation if you continue to harass us. We are in these periods now. Now, what God's saying that when it was possible for all these things to happen, that you would know you're in that fig tree season, that the springtime now is budding and it's about to bloom. The end of mankind is what he's talking about. And in the years ahead, you're going to see all these things come to pass in a more accelerated and speeded rate than we've ever seen before. Going on. As sin increases, so does the chastisement of the sin revealed in Leviticus 26, when you see the seven times greater recompense. So what I've got in that little box, we talk about abortion, LGBTQ, the lawlessness, our open borders, socialism, and on and on and on. During this period of increased chastisement, Satan has convinced the world that the calamities are caused by climate change. It's the fault of not adhering to the new green, the Pope, or climatologist. He totally ignores the God, God's warnings that if you, dis, if you are disobedient and you rebel, these things, these curses, these judgments are going to come upon you. Now, over the last 60 years, America has been in a decline. It's easy to go look at the books, look at the records, and you'll see if, while it seems to become richer and richer, it actually has become poorer and poorer. But in 2020, that decline accelerated. Leviticus 26 said, If you will not yet repent, if you're not yet for all of this hearken to me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. Leviticus 26, 24, I will also walk contrary to you and will punish you yet seven times. 26, verse 28 says the same thing. It says, I will chastise you seven times. When you look at these words, punished in strongs, it's called yakar, which is to chasten, to correct, or instruct. The next set of version, yakar, is a different word, means to strike severely, to smite, or to slay. So what God's saying that he's going to punish us yet, each time the severity of the punishment continues to increase. And I'm going to show you that in the, in the cycle of the seven times in the seven years that we've talked about over and over again. By the way, you can go back, that sermon, The Nation in Crisis, 2021, and you will see that these are the slides that I used back then that we're going to be bringing this up to date. All right, this is the third time. It's another word back to 3256, but it's used with something else. It's used in conjunction with a, a, an additional uh, piece of information says, I will also bring fury, God's fury into it. So when you combine that, it's talking about a, to a case of total calamity. When God says, I'm going to continue to make things so bad that you can't get out of this. And, that's, and Luke 21 talks about that. A time when there's no way to cure and to, to resolve and to put mankind back on a, uh, a course for peace and safety. In other words, we're reaching that time right now. 
Now, all of those curses align to, when you look at them, to the Shemitah years from 2020, uh, 2001 to 2029. 20, you see, every seven years. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and put that up there. 2001, we began to see the breakdown of our borders. 2008, we saw the financial crash. And with, that got pretty close to toppling the rest of the world. That was basically because of the financial crisis. 2015, we've seen it move into a more spiritual realm. That's also the time we saw the blood and moon tetrads coming out. Well, the eighth time, it's like God was warning us, like he's warned ancient Israel, that number eight is new beginnings. It is looking like from that period of time, as we move here, the assault on this nation and around the world is like Satan now has been unleashed. And he was beginning his attack in lining things up in that seven-year period from 2015 to 2022. Now, we're in 2022, so if we go back and we compare what's going on today back to 2015, it's a real easy comparison to see how disruptive and how, how less godly this nation has become, if that is possible when you look from 2015, but it has. 2022, we didn't know exactly what 2022 would bring. We were at the beginning in phases. Well, we can look back now, half a year, and you can see what's happened to the United States since the fall holy days last year. We're in a pitiful state of affairs compared to last year. We're in that. Now, we're going to also move into what I believe could be, I don't know for sure, but it could be the last full seven-year uh, session of Christ's return. Because the things are moving so bad so quickly, we just don't know what will happen. So I brought up the little question mark back then, what will happen? The point is what I'm trying to make is we don't know exactly what will happen. We know what God's going to bring us to because we understand prophecy. We know the seals. But the thing we don't know is the path he's taken us on. This is really important. So when I get into the nuggets portion today, and I'm talking about in, in the desert, there's a lesson for us because you see... This is the period that if we had to put ourselves in comparison to the former and the latter, we're moving into the time of the desert. And there's lessons there for us to learn because, see, we don't know where we're going. We know the end course, of course. That's when the return of Jesus Christ. But we don't know where we're going to get there and where God's taken us as a whole. So now, the nation in crisis. Now we're looking at last year, we talked about the health care was out of control. We talked about there were 93,000 overdoses back then. But now we've reached a million overdoses. I mean, I'm sorry, 100,000 overdoses and over a million people killed by COVID. And now the left is making a religion out of the vaccine. It's the science. It's amazing how much they're pushing to get vaccinated and to get your boosters, and everybody who gets them still gets COVID. I don't know that it actually reduces it from going in a hospital. Maybe it does. I don't know. But you, but you make a science out of it? Let's play this video. New York Governor Kathy Hochul has never actually been elected to the office she holds, but she has tested positive for COVID-19. Recently, right now, and you know what that means. It means the vaccine works perfectly. Here's a statement she released. Thankfully, I'm vaccinated and boosted. A reminder to all New Yorkers, get vaccinated and boosted. <laughs> She's just reading the catechism. If that sounds like a religious ritual, well, because to Kathy Hochul, the vaccine is a religion. Here she was in September. I wear my vaccinated necklace all the time to say I'm vaccinated. All of you. Yes, I know you're vaccinated. You're the smart ones. But you know there's people out there who aren't listening to God and what God wants. You know this. You know who they are. I need you to be my apostles. I need you to go out and talk about it and say, we owe this to each other. We love each other. Jesus taught us to love one another. And how do you show that love but to care about each other enough to say, please get vaccinated because I love you. I want you to live. That is the governor of New York. God's telling us you got to get vaccinated. And she's asking for apostles now to go out and spread the word. Unbelievable. Where's, where's <laughs> faith and trust in God? What happened to separation of church and state? That conveniently disappears when they wanted to, doesn't it? All righty, suicides in 2019 was 47,000. 
I didn't get a chance to look into the suicides where we're at in 2021, but it's a lot higher. 460,000 have thought about it, they said. God's judgment and pestilences. Look at Deuteronomy 28. God says, I will send upon you cursing and vexation and rebuke in all that you set your hand to do until you be destroyed. By the way, <laughs> I couldn't help it. Because God's bringing all this, and we just heard from the New York. You know what New York City's doing now? They're bringing back masks right now because COVID is increasing again in New York City. In the city where they're preaching, it's a religion. God wants you to be vaxxed. Well, they're vaxxed more than most any city in the nation. And now they're receiving more and more of the COVID increasing. So they went on high alert just on Tuesday morning. They put the announcement out, start wearing your mask again. Not a rule yet, but it's coming. Unbelievable. All right, let's go on. God says that everything we do, he said, it's only going to perish. It's not going to work. You know, I, I, I could go back and read and you know that you know what I've read you here about this. What I'm trying to do now, I want to move on to show you and get bring this into uh, position for today. The Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto you. And that's what we're looking at. This is not going away. They finally admitted that this is going to be something we're going to live with probably forever is what they're trying to tell us. It's going to be more variable. So it's going to get worse. It's going to get better. Who knows exactly where it's going to be. But they're telling everybody, get used to it because it is going to cleave unto us. Well, that was a promise that God made back then. COVID is not leaving. It's evolving into other strains and reaffecting those who have been vaccinated. Now those who have been vaccinated, they've had COVID two and three times since they got vaccinated and boosted. Going on. The growing ratios, as we said that this was coming. Now you heard that over the weekend, what's going to go on. And the gentleman was the young man who, who killed all these people. He was pretty clear. He was definitely racial. The man was a psychotic and should have been locked up long before this, before he hurt anybody. But the critical race theory is adding to the problem. They're not fixing it. We're morally bankrupt, as you've seen in the video with the LGBTQ and the transgender and the abortion issues. I'm going to bring you two videos about this. First of all, I want you to see the mindset of leadership and news media about embracing abortion and mocking pro-life. Let's play that video. And, and while I think it is terrible that um, a justice would have to go into hiding, I think it is really clear to the justices now that, as Anna mentioned, 64 to 66 percent of Americans believe that the Supreme Court should uphold Roe v. Wade, right? And so that being said, um, maybe these protests and maybe this outcry gives Chief Justice Roberts some leverage for a more moderate mm -hmm. approach. But the media mob, they didn't stop there. One commentator, MSDNC, saying she wants to make sweet love to the Supreme Court leaker and then joyfully abort the fetus. You can't make this up. Take a look. Here's my feeling about the leaker. I, I would like to find out who the leaker is so I can make sweet love to that person because that person is a <laughs> hero to me, okay? And if the leaker, yeah. a lot of people are saying it could be a conservative, if the leaker is a Republican, uh, and if I get pregnant during our lovemaking, I will joyfully abort our fetus and let them know. <laughs> I don't know if that answered your question. I probably did it. That's a national news show. And, and maybe they were awkward in that kind of response, but everybody's sitting there laughing about the response. But openly saying that I would gladly, if I get pregnant, breaking God's law, I don't even know who the person is, I will be glad to abort that fetus. Now, the other lady says, I killed my baby. But you see, this one says fetus, so that's a denial that it's actually human life, is what they're trying to say. How about this one? Here's another video. This is Janet Yellen saying, and this, I'm not making this up either, as you just heard, you can't make this up. She's telling us that a lot of our economy has to have abortion. Let's play this video. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, welcome. I, I want to talk to you about some things that also can affect our economy. Uh, the ability to have full uh, control over one's reproductive health has real-world economic consequences. 
According to the Institute for Women's Policy Research, current state-level abortion restrictions already cost the United States about $105 billion annually due to reduced earning levels, increased job turnover, and time off for women. So, Secretary Yellen, uh, if the draft of the court's majority holding in Roe versus Way is the actual decision, what impact will the loss of abortion access mean economically for women? Well, I believe that eliminating the right of women to make decisions about when and whether to have children would have very damaging effects um, on the economy and would set women back decades. Roe v. Wade and access to reproductive health care, including abortion, helped lead to increased labor force participation. It enabled uh, many women to finish school. That increased their earning potential. It allowed women to plan and balance their families and careers. And research also shows that it had a favorable impact on the well-being and earnings um, of, ch of children. Um, there are many research studies that have been done um, over the years looking at the economic mm -hmm. impacts of access or lack thereof to abortion, and it makes clear that denying women access to abortion increase their odds of living in poverty or need for public assistance. For half of the uh, population of America, eliminating a right that has existed for half a century, particularly for low-income and minority women who have already shouldered much of the burden from the COVID pandemic would be a, a disaster. Now, I understand where they're coming from as far as a person working with a child without a child. I understand all that. But to put it in an argument of abortion for financial needs for a nation, that's unbelievable, for what, we're, what we're looking at here. I mean, there's, there's no reason in the time we live today you couldn't have prevented measurements to take place We're going all this. Why do you have to wait till you have to kill a baby to go through all that? This nation is going to pay a price for all of these things, whether they realize it or not. The nation's in denial. Last year, we had $28 trillion in debt, and inflation, we said, was beginning to rise. We told you that in 2022, you're going to begin to see an inflation level that's, that's beyond what we've seen in 40 years, and we are there now. And I'm telling you now, by the fall, it's going to continue to rise in deliberate uh, response to what we're doing and what we need today. It was just unbelievable just... Just this morning, I looked at the oil. It was $114 a barrel, $114 a barrel. So that means we haven't reached our peak. First Corinthians says this, I, for it is written, I will destroy the wise, the wisdom of the wise, and I'll bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Why am I saying that and bringing that in here? We were talking about back then, we were talking about inflation. Back then, take a look at this next box coming up. Let's bring that up on the screen. Biden's Build Back Better plan will ease inflation. This was written by 15 Nobel Prize economist winners. They looked at the economy and they said, listen, the, the information that's being brought out by Biden, if we get this passed, it's going to reduce the inflation. It's not going to increase it. Well, how's that working? Well, this is the slide I brought you last week talking about the PPI, which is the producer price index and the CPI. The PPI is on the wholesale level. Look at the light height that was 9.7 percent. The, the CPI is at 7.9 percent back in December. We brought it up on the right very corner down there. The CPI went to 8.5 percent. On Friday of this past week, the PPI just came out showing that the index went to 11 percent. That means we have not seen the end of the CPI rising. If the, if the producer index is continuing to rise, in the next month or two or three, it begins to hit the consumer. Those levels continue to go up. So now, they said back that year that this inflation was simply transitory. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell acknowledged to the Senate Banking Committee that the stubbornly high inflation might stick around for quite some time. Not according to the 15 
economic Nobel laureates who won prizes in the economy. Fifteen of them got it wrong. Somewhere now they're telling you 17, but that's just somebody just mistranslated the information of the letter that actually had 15 names on it. He said, indeed, in fact, the, trans the inflation looks longer, no longer transitory, increased the odds of a central bank will be wrapping up to taper our asset purchase sooner rather than later. So they're saying we just can't keep buying all this debt. We're going to have to cut it down and raise, in, raise the, the level of the loans that you're going to be able to borrow money from. It's going to slow down the economy. Well, it is. Deuteronomy 28:25 says this, The Lord shall cause you to be smitten before your enemies, and you shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them, and you shall be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. Now, you may say, well, what does that got to do with the economy? Well, it has to do with the crisis in America. So what am I bringing out? Everywhere we look, we're being smitten. Even in our nation. Remember, this was last year when we talk about Afghanistan, we brought this out. In Deuteronomy 28, it says, You shall become an astonishment, a proverb, a byword among the nations, where the Lord shall lead you. So what we're looking at with Afghanistan after 20 years, thousands of lives lost, pulling out, we're running seven ways fleeing from that nation. We left $83 billion on the table of stockpiles of weaponry helicopters, Humvees, you name it, that the Taliban was selling to other Arab nations and to terrorist groups, money we just left as we fled that nation. How about the weather? Well, we've been kind of blessed this year. The weather hasn't been as bad this, this spring as it has been in the past, so we have a little bit of a reprieve. But what's lining up are the droughts coming to the west and fires. We're not out of the woods by any means. How about this? The Afghanistan war that we talked about after 20 years. This is showing pictures of them fleeing as the Afghan president fled the country and the government crumbled the U.S. military race to evacuate the diplomats and civilians from increasingly pick, uh, panicked city. Now, they've still got hundreds of Americans over there and thousands of others, Afghans, who were helping the United States while we were there for the last 20 years, they still there and they won't let them out. Now, this is coming, going to get a lot worse. The broken borders are rapidly growing out of control. We have lost our global dominance around the world right now. How do you tell the people in the United States all these things are going on? They don't want to talk about it. So don't bother me. Things will be fine. We've always had this. Never have we seen all of this at one time. Look what God says. We got, right here, we're talking about our global dominance. God says he's going to take away our leadership around the world. Right now, we're looking at Apple has lost his crown as the most valuable company to the oil giant Saudi Aramco. Saudi Aramco now is the largest business in the world. Now we're talking about the president of the United States, talking about our dominance. He's talking about flying over to Saudi Arabia to beg them to produce more oil to reduce the prices of, of oil and gas. They won't even pick up a phone and talk to us. Now he's let the leak out through his administration that he wants to go over there and talk to them about increasing oil. At the same time this past week, as the oil prices continued to rise, he canceled the leases in Alaska, one of the largest oil reserves in the world, and he won't let them drill for it. At the same time, just the week before, he canceled the leases in many of the platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. So this whole thing is just tumbling down around our ears. So as soaring commodity prices swell, profits of energy companies and technology stocks continue to slide. Well, that has turned around from last year. Now they're setting record profits now because the prices of oil continue to rise. In the meantime, while all of these things are going on without anybody looking, China now has been preparing for war. We talked about it, but take a look at this newscast out of India. Let's play this video. Does practice make you perfect at war? 
Well, China certainly thinks so. Satellite images have revealed their so-called practice ranges. Take a look at this one. It is located deep in a desert in Xinjiang. Now the layout is interesting. It resembles a naval base with a warship. Not a Chinese naval base, a Taiwanese naval base. Experts have identified the similarities. China's practice range resembles a base in northeast Taiwan. If war breaks out, this base would be crucial. So what does China do? Practice missile strikes on replicas. Now when I say replicas, they are pretty spot on. The pier, the warships, everything is built to specification. Reports say this was made in December. Once completed, China's PLA blew it up with a missile strike. Sort of like a dress rehearsal before the real deal. And it's not just Taiwan. Replicas have been spotted of US bases in Japan and Guam. So China is readying for a wider war. The question is, will they put their practice into motion? They certainly have the tools. China is known to have developed two hypersonic missiles. One is called the Carrier Killer. The other is called the Guam Killer. Well, you can imagine why. The second missile has a range of 5,000 kilometers. In other words, enough to hit the US military base in Guam. If this is not warmongering, what is? China is replicating Taiwanese bases in their deserts. The pier, the ships, the defenses, everything. And these replicas are being blown to smithereens by the PLA. How is this not escalation? It clearly means China is thinking about war. I've got more evidence for you. Take a look at this satellite picture. What you're looking, what you're looking at is a Chinese shipyard. That blue object is an attack submarine, possibly a nuclear-powered one. Intelligence reports had repeatedly warned of this, that China is developing a new class of submarines. And this could be it. More range, more reliable, and more protection for Chinese warships. Clearly, the dragon is eyeing the high seas. They literally have built life-size replicas of air bases in Taiwan and, and in, uh, in, in, in Guam and have actually blown them up in their practice of military exercises in case it comes to war. How come our news stories over here aren't telling us about this? But that's what's been going on over in China. We are entering into the lean years. We've been talking about that for quite a few weeks. And actually, when I went back into last summer, that's when we began talking about going into the lean years as God was talking and warning us about. How do you get to the lean years? Well, you have to destroy the engine of what produces the goods. So here's what I'm going to show you as we begin to bring this session down and then we move into the second part of our program today. What about the engine of America? We talked, I heard the news just this morning say we've got a strong economy and we have a strong spending base from the American people. Well, that's actually not really true, what they're saying. This was from a 2015 congressional budget report. This is what's showing us, and I'm going to bring this up bigger in just a few minutes. This is showing us the, the cumulative growth from 1980 after taxes and transfers to 2015. It's showing us the percentage of games after all the new giveaway programs. In other words, this picture that I'm going to bring up now, in, enlarge it, is showing you from 1980 to 2015, after taxes, after giveaways, the amount of money you take home, you have left. How has that growth worked for the people in America? This is a four position process. This is the top one, the, 80, the 81 to 99 percentile top group in income, the middle and then the lowest quintiles. All right. So that's what we're looking at. So let's look at the first one. The first top percent and during this period of time, the richer have become richer, 242 percent. They have gone up during that period of time. But now let's put these two together. The people right near the top from 81% of the earners to the 99 to the very lowest of earners in America during that same period of time. Look at that box at the lower corner. You see me circled. They went up what they have left about the same amount of percentage. That means they had the same amount of money, just the same amount of percentage growth during that same period after taxes and everything else. Why is that? Well, it's because of this, All right? Right here, it's showing that 81 to 99 percent of the lowest earners grew at the same percentage gains for 35 years. Well, that doesn't tell us why, does it? 
Well, here's what tells us why. All right, let's eliminate all that. Let's now go to the middle in class income. The middle income has seen the lowest increases and are now paying for the lowest earners growth. So what have we seen? The cost of bringing the lowest earners up has not been on the backs of the wealthiest or almost the wealthiest. It's been on the middle class. The middle class earners now are struggling more than ever. Take a look at this chart. The middle class represented 56.5% of the country back in 1979. That middle class now is only 45% of our country. That means the amount of money that they get to pay taxes and to supply everything, that revenue base is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And they're having less and less money to work with. That's what we're talking about with the engine. Now we come back to this chart again where we're at a little while ago. Why is that possible? The working middle class, the CPI, went to 8.5% in March. The PPI I showed you a few minutes ago went to 11%. Now let's take a look at this. If we take out food and energy, this is very important because this is the area targeted by this administration. The very first thing he did was begin to shut down the pipelines, begin to close down the oil refineries, turning everything to go green. Didn't matter that we could afford it or we have it available. But what that began to do is turn the economy into, into an engine that they couldn't support. So they had to give away money to get it going at the same time. What did that do? It cost the inflation. But now take a look at this picture, X food and energy. Where would you stand if you didn't have to buy your food and gas? Or if your food and your gas was the same price as it was two years ago? X food and energy, CPI, 0.6%. That means everything else only went up 0.6%. But things you have to have that are built around oil has, has gone crazy. X uh, fuel and energy for the PPI was 2.3%. Again, that's showing us this is going to continue to rise. The cost of the working middle class, this is the average, depending on your position. You are spending $3,450 to $5,200 a year or more to just exist on what you did two years ago. Out of your pocket. The middle class can only absorb so much of this. So all that spending they say is coming, that will begin to deteriorate. Just on Tuesday morning, this was released. The retail prices in April went up to 9%. 9% is already increased from March, and that's not finished. Because you see, we're at 11%. And we haven't reached the peak yet. Because see, this, this fall, when the, when the prices are going to begin coming in, that they're going to be selling their wheat, and all their food supplies, and for next year, all those prices begin to set in because, see, they've been spending because they can't get what they need. So everything in that area hasn't even hit the shelves yet. It isn't looking good going forward. Now, next week and a few weeks ahead, we're going to be talking about these because these are very important. You need to understand. The health is shifting to a one-world governance. This is major. Biden is talking about turning our health care over to who? The World Health Organization. No longer would the United States, if this happens, determine what's best for their own interest. We will now turn part of our world, or our, our government, over to the world. That's big. They're also talking about removing Title 42. I believe it's next Monday, if I'm not mistaken. This year, they're already seeing records surpassing last month that was 242,000 illegals come in. Now they're talking about they could possibly see in one month as much as 500,000 illegals crossing our border in one month. So we're going to talk about that. And Iran now is getting closer to a nuclear agreement. The United States has just resolved that they're going to remove some of the restrictions of who are terrorists in the region at Iran's request, being negotiated by none other than Russia. All right.
Let's take a break. We've got a great little video here. When we come back, we're going to talk about preparing for the lean lessons in the desert. So let's take a break. Take a look at this little video here. Your light still shines. I'll be right back. Alrighty, welcome back. All right, let's get into our nuggets portion of, of our program today. Preparing for the lean, our lessons in the desert. Just like the children of Israel as they went through the desert, God tried them by fire. And God tells us that he's going to try us by fire also. 1 Corinthians 3.13 says, Every man's work shall be made manifest in the day that shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So as we move closer and closer to the return of Jesus Christ, each one of us are going to be tried and tested to where we're going to stand to produce the fruits that God expects from each one of us. Deuteronomy 1 says this, These be the words which Moses spoke to Israel on this side of the Jordan in the wilderness, in the plain against the Red Sea between Paran, Topel, Laban, and Hesaroth, and Dizabab. This is the time when Moses actually began. He pulled them all together, and it was like a fireside chat, you might say. So he began to tell them what God had instructed them and reminded them of what they were going through, kind of like we were doing today, reminding everybody what God showed us over the past year or two. And they were on this side of the Jordan. In other words, they weren't yet in the promised land. This is all before they went over in the land of Moab, Moses began to declare this law, saying, The Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough in this mount. Wouldn't it be nice when we finally say, God said, Enough is enough. You've been here long enough. It's time to draw it to an end. Jesus, his son, the father would say, Go down and bring this to an end. That's what we're waiting for. Well, that's what God told them when he said, Look, God said, look, this has been enough. It's time for you all to move on. God's instructions to ancient Israel coming out of Egypt. From the moment that God called out the children of Israel, he told them what he was going to do. He also told them where he was taking them to the promised land. What God didn't tell them was the day to day of their journey. Now, if you remember at the beginning of our program today, that's what I told you. What God is showing us, he's told us where we're going. He told us what's going to be there. He also told us the problems we're going to face when we get there. But what he didn't tell us this was the day to day of the journey. See, we don't know what tomorrow is going to bring. Now, we know where we're going to be eventually. But tomorrow morning when you wake up, you don't know what God's got in store for you. We have to learn. So why did God do it that way? Two specific reasons, and I'm sure there are many more. These two, first, trust which is their faith in him. 
So what God does for you and I, so he tells us where your eventual path's going to be, and he says, now you're going to have to trust me, the path I put you on to take you there. It's called faith. That's what God's done with them, and he's giving it to us. The second was, is their obedience or their willingness to serve God. God says, this is what you have to do. This is how you to react. This is the way you're supposed to think, things you're supposed to do to go to that promised land. So he didn't tell them the day to day, and he expected certain things from us as a part of our covenant with him. So what did God expect from them? It was pretty simple. He expected their love and appreciation is that of a father and a child. In other words, when you grow up and you're a child, you trust your parents. They make those decisions that you did when you're a child that you don't know. Even when you get to be a teen, you might think you know more than your parents, but generally you don't. And so you trust the parents. So what he wants from us is our love and our obedience, and he expects that coming back as a father and a child in that relationship. So now, with that, let's take a look at the exhortation of Israel's journey we find in Deuteronomy 2, verse 7. For the Lord your God hath blessed you in all the works of your hands. He knows you're walking through this great wilderness these 40 years. The Lord has God has been with you. You lacked nothing. Now, we need to stop right there. In our lessons, in our journey to the promised land, in our duality of the former and the latter, we are in the same boat. Wherever God takes us, we need to understand what God just recounted right here to the children of Israel before they're going into the promised land. You lacked nothing. So no matter where God takes us to, the calamities, shortfalls, pain, suffering, you name it, whatever God lets you go through is to the limitation that God wants you to have. You lacked nothing, and God wants us to be appreciative. Because remember, the problem they had is they didn't appreciate what God gave them. Look at John 14. He says, I'll go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare, I will come again, and I will receive unto you myself, that where I am you may be also. Look at Revelation 21. I saw the new heaven and the new earth, for the first heaven was passed away. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So God's busy preparing the way for you and I. And here's the instruction that he gave us. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. So just like the children of Israel, as they went through the promised land, God will not forsake us. He will not leave us. He's busy and he's preparing to take us to our promised land, the kingdom of God. All right, that's our lesson in the lean. All right, in the mail this week, Never Let Go by Steve Council and the sermon I delivered about a month ago, Isaiah 9, talking about the enemy of socialism, by all the means. And then coming in two weeks, finally, we've got the paper, we've got the print. The quarterly is back. <laughs> we keep it going this time with uh, all of what we need, talking about the world on the brink of World War III, coming out in two weeks. If you're not on the mailing list, get on that mailing list so you can get this magazine. All righty, here we go. Our last video of the day. The Lord is our rock. Take a look at that video and I'll be right back to close our program.
All right, welcome back. Well, that's it for our program today. A lot of information, a lot we couldn't even get to, but we're going to get into it in the future. Be sure to stay tuned. If you don't have anywhere to go tomorrow, pray <laughs> that we can live stream. It worked last week. We don't know what it'll bring in next week, but we, we're trying to get these sermons to you live streamed. Uh, Cox is supposed to be doing something. They're shutting down tomorrow and rebooting, cleaning up the act, and maybe they'll have everything fixed for us and we'll be able to live stream like we used to be able to do. So if you don't have services, by all means, tune in for the sermon that I'm going to give you tomorrow. It's very important, vital for the time we live today. Well, that's it for our program. Thanks for watching and tuning in. Remember to share this with everyone you know, and they're going to love you for it or not. Till next week, God bless you.